Good morning from Dublin, and welcome to your Sunday service. I'm really glad that you're able to join us today. Now, let us begin with the reading of the Creed of the Church of Scientology. Before I start, I'd like to go over a word with you. That word is inalienable. Something that is inalienable is something that is yours, and it cannot be taken away from you or given away by you. It will always be yours. The Creed of the Church of Scientology. We of the church believe that all men of whatever race, color, or creed were created with equal rights. That all men have inalienable rights to their own religious practices and their performance. That all men have inalienable rights to their own lives. That all men have inalienable rights to their sanity that all men have inalienable rights to their own defense, that all men have inalienable rights to conceive, choose, assist, or support their own organizations, churches, and governments, that all men have inalienable rights to think freely, to talk freely, to write freely their own opinions, and to counter or utter or write upon the opinions of others, that all men have inalienable rights to the creation of their own kind, that the souls of men have the rights of men, that the study of the mind and the healing of mentally caused ills should not be alienated from religion or condoned in non-religious fields, and that no agency less than God has the power to suspend or set aside these rights, overtly or covertly. And we of the church believe that man is basically good, that he is seeking to survive, that his survival depends upon himself and upon his fellows in his attainment of brotherhood with the universe. And we of the church believe that the laws of God forbid man to destroy his own kind, to destroy the sanity of another, to destroy or enslave another soul, to destroy or reduce the survival of one's companions or one's group. And we of the church believe that the spirit can be saved and that the spirit alone may save or heal the body. Now these, are the beliefs in which we stand firm on. Now, there's a lot of information that goes around on a daily basis. You have the news, you have coffee shops, conversations with friends, the radio, and also newspapers. But what happens when you see something that's not true because you know that it's not true? Well, let's have a look at what L. Von Hubbard says about personal integrity. What is true for you is what you have observed yourself. And when you lose that, you have lost everything. What is personal integrity? Personal integrity is knowing what you know. What you know is what you know. And to have the courage to know and say what you have observed. And that is integrity, and there is no other integrity. Now, you can think of a time where someone may have said something that was not true, and you stood firm on what it is that you observed, and you spoke out against it. That was you sticking with your personal integrity. Now, you also may find times where you may have been silent or not spoke out against something that you saw or heard that was not true. It happened. Okay, now you see what personal integrity is. Of course, we can talk about honor, truth, all these things, these esoteric terms. But I think they'd all be covered very well if what we really observed was what we observed. That we took care to observe what we're observing and that we always observed to observe. So you keeping a state of mind of where you are actually causatively observing something. You know that you're observing it. You're making sure that you're not taking in any bias, any data from some other source. You're looking directly at that thing for what it is and not on some via from some other place. And not necessarily maintaining a skeptical attitude, a critical attitude, or an open mind but certainly maintaining sufficient personal integrity and sufficient personal belief and confidence in self and courage that we can observe what we observe and say what we have observed. Nothing in Dianetics and Scientology is true for you unless you have observed it 
and it is true according to your observation. That is all. Now today we're going to be going over something that's quite interesting and very workable for you and you may find some great use in this information as you continue on the journey and that we've started on this new year. Now, let us have a look at the conditions of existence. Be, do, have. There are three conditions of existence. These three conditions comprise life. They are be, do, and have. The condition of being is defined as the assumption of a category of identity. It could be said to be the role in a game, and an example of beingness could be one's own name. Another example would be one's profession. Another example would be one's physical characteristics. Each or all of these things could be called one's beingness. Beingness is assumed by oneself or given to oneself or is attained. For example, in the playing of a game, each player has his own beingness. I'm not sure how many of you are accustomed to the game of American football, but not every player on the field is a quarterback, which is the one who gives, delivers the ball to the other players on the team that are capable of holding and running or catching the ball. Not everyone on the team is able or capable of catching the ball while running. There are people who must defend. There are people who must score. There are people who must attack. But everyone has their own beingness on the field. The second condition of existence is doing. By doing, we mean action. Function, accomplishment, the attainment of goals, the fulfilling of purpose, or any change of position in space. The third condition is havingness. By havingness, we mean owning, possessing, being capable of commanding, positioning, taking charge of objects, energies, or spaces. The essential definition of having is to be able to touch or permeate or to direct the disposition of. The game of life demands that one assumes a beingness in order to accomplish a doingness in the direction of havingness. These three conditions are given in order of seniority, where life is concerned. The ability to be is more important than the ability to do. The ability to do is more important than the ability to have. And most people, all three conditions are sufficiently confused that they are best understood in reverse order. When one has clarified the idea of possession or havingness, one can then proceed to clarify doingness for general activity. And when this is done, one understands beingness or identity. A lot of riddles in human behavior can be solved by realizing this goes out of sequence or gets omissions. The Spanish peasant and the Spanish officials go to war at the drop of a straw. Their history is jammed with revolts. The peasant knows that if he is a peasant, which is the beingness, and does his work, which is a doingness, he should have. The Spanish official is stuck in be. He has no, he has, so he can be, and he doesn't have to do anything. Also, a degree or title in Spain is a be, and there is no do. So there is no have unless it comes from the peasant. The two altered cycles collide. Juvenile delinquency and shattered lives in the West stem directly from corruptions of this cycle. Children in the West are commonly asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? It's a silly question and can drive any child up the wall because it's the wrong question. It hits the wrong end of the cycle. He is also asked, what are you going to do in life? That is just as bad. It is quite difficult to answer. You have to work it out backwards. Establish the product, what you wish to have. Find out what to do to achieve it. And only then, really, can you accurately discover what one has to be 
to accomplish this. A lot of people fail this because they don't do this. A beingness taken first all too often winds up in a doingness without any havingness resulting. If we ask children, what do you want to produce in life? We could probably get a workable answer. From that, he could figure out what he'd have to do to produce. That, and from that, he could know what he had to be. Then, with a little cooperation, he could be able to lead a happy and valuable life. Concentrating on B, one finds him ready to be all right, but then he stands around for the next 50 years waiting for his havingness to fall out of the sky or slide to him via a welfare state. This data missing in society contributes to juvenile delinquency, crime, the welfare state, and a dying civilization. It is essential to a successful existence that each of these three conditions be clarified and understood. Now, you yourself can take a moment and look at something that you really wish to have in your life. What is it? Better body, nice car, bigger house, better job. What might that be? So you take that, find out what it is that you would need to do to acquire that havingness. Now that you've worked out the things that you need to do, look at what it is that you would have to be in order to do those things so that you can have what it is that you wish to have. Try that out for yourself. Learn more about the conditions of existence and how they apply in life. Read L. Ron Hubbard's Scientology, The Fundamentals of Thought. Considered the first book of Scientology. It is filled with basic principles you can put to immediate use to increase your understanding. And now we'll be ending Sunday service with the reading of the Scientology Prayer for Total Freedom. May the author of the universe enable all men to reach an understanding of their spiritual nature. May awareness and understanding of life expand so that all may come to know the author of the universe. And may others also reach this understanding which brings total freedom. At this time, we think of those whose liberty is threatened, of those who have suffered imprisonment for their beliefs, of those who are enslaved or martyred, and for all those who are brutalized, trapped, or attacked. We pray that human rights will be preserved so that all people may believe and worship freely, so that freedom will once again be seen in our land. Freedom from war and poverty and want, freedom to be, freedom to do, and freedom to have. Freedom to use and understand man's potential, a potential that is God-given and God-like. And freedom to achieve that understanding and awareness that is total freedom. May God let it be so. Thank you for coming and joining us for this Sunday service. I look forward to seeing you next week.